Hi, I'm Dr. Scott Cleos. And I'm Dr. Andrea Cleos. Today we're talking about back pain. Low back pain is the leading cause of disability worldwide and is the most common reason for missed work. It's the second most common cause to visit your doctor's office, only second to upper respiratory infections. About $50 billion is spent every year on the treatment and the diagnosis of low back pain. It is estimated that over 80% of us at some point in our life are going to experience low back pain. The following is basically a video user's manual to teach you how your back works, the different types of back pain and their causes, and most importantly, maintenance and care of your lumbar spine to keep it functional and relatively pain-free for a lifetime. So let's get started. Hi, I'm Juliana. The lower back is part of the musculoskeletal system, consisting of, as the name suggests, the muscles and bones of our bodies. The bones provide support and protection, while the muscles apply forces to the bones, allowing us to move our limbs, walk around, and even talk to you like I'm doing right now. Starting from the top, the upper seven vertebrae make up the neck, connecting the head to the chest and are collectively referred to as the cervical spine. The spine has a slight forward arch known as the lordotic curvature. Below the neck are the 12 vertebral bodies of the thoracic spine or chest. These vertebrae all contain ribs that protect our vital organs like our heart, lungs, kidneys, liver, and spleen. The thoracic spine naturally arches slightly backward in what is called a kyphotic curvature. The ribs themselves help provide extrinsic support to the thoracic vertebral bodies. Therefore, there is very little movement in the region of the thoracic spine. The five non-ribbed vertebrae between the chest and the pelvis are known as the lumbar spine and, like the cervical spine, are slightly arched forward in a lordotic curvature. Below the lumbar spine is the sacrum, a series of five fused vertebrae that articulates or connects with the pelvis through the sacroiliac or SI joint. The spine is an amazing biomechanical structure. It is sturdy enough to support the torso and the head, yet flexible enough to allow a complex set of movements, including this awesome display of gymnastics maneuvers. Most importantly, the spine is perfectly engineered to allow all of these functions while simultaneously protecting the delicate neuronal pathways that keep my legs, arms, and body moving while I'm flipping, twisting, and bending. The brain sits above the spinal column encased in the protective skull. At the base of the skull, the foramen magnum, or great hole, allows the spinal cord containing all the neuronal communications to and from the body to enter the spinal canal. As the cord descends, individual nerve radicals or nerve roots exit the canal via the neural foramina to innervate regional muscles and bring sensory information from the regional tissues back to the brain. A solid cord is present throughout the cervical and thoracic levels, but ends near the top of the lumbar spine at about the level of the first lumbar vertebrae. This tapered terminal portion of the cord is called the conus medullaris, Latin for medullary cone. Below this level, long nerve fibers to the lumbar and sacral portions of the spine are referred to as the cauda equina as anatomically the bundle of individual long nerve roots in this region resemble a horse's tail. There are many causes of back and leg pain, some which are temporary while others not so much. As Juliana pointed out, the elegant design of the backbone provides the strength and physical integrity to support the head and torso, flexibility to allow complex movements of bending and twisting, yet sturdy enough to protect the delicate nerve fibers that innervate the muscles and organs of the body. Humans are bipedal. 
walking upright on two legs, which places a lot of structural demand on our spines when compared to our fellow quadruped mammals. As such, our backs are more prone to degenerative processes as we age. Over the next few minutes, we'll present a graphic summary of the most common causes of back and leg pain. Let's start with some regional anatomy. Here we have two adjacent vertebral segments of the lumbar spine. From a structural standpoint, each vertebrae can be defined by its anterior and posterior elements. Anteriorly, we have the vertebral bodies which are separated by an intervertebral disc providing some flexibility and cushioning between the bodies themselves. Posteriorly, we have the spinous and transverse processes that provide bony anchors for regional muscles, tendons, and ligaments. The slightly ovoid space between the vertebral bodies and the posterior elements is called the spinal canal, providing a channel which contains the spinal cord and nerve roots. Since we're in the region of the lumbar spine, there is no solid cord, just the individual nerve fibers of the cauda equina. The facets make up the articulating joints of the posterior elements that allow the vertebrae to move slightly relative to one another while maintaining the structural support of the spinal column. Individual nerve radicals off of the cord come together to form nerve roots which exit the spinal column through the neural foramina, a channel bordered by the vertebral bodies and disc anteriorly and the facet joint posteriorly. In the lumbar region, the exiting nerve root is defined by the upper vertebral level. For instance, if these are the L4 and L5 vertebrae, the exiting nerve root is labeled L4. There are intrinsic muscles, tendons, and ligaments that move, secure, and stabilize the vertebrae. Probably the most common cause of temporary back pain is seen in the middle-aged weekend warrior with excessive and unfamiliar activity producing strain and injury to these structures or the large muscles of the back. The intervertebral disc consists of a fibrous capsule securing a gelatinous core that acts like a shock absorber between the adjacent vertebral bodies. Excessive stress on the disc from a combination of weakening of the regional muscles and tendons, usually from disuse, prolonged standing, and obesity of the trunk, can damage the fibrous capsule of the disc causing it to bulge outwards. In response to the altered mechanics, Spurs can form on the margins of the adjacent vertebral bodies and the combination of disc and spur can encroach on the regional exiting nerve root. The altered mechanics can similarly affect the posterior part of the vertebrae causing the facets to degenerate and enlarge which can be a source of back discomfort in and of itself. In addition, the enlarged facet can further compromise and narrow the neural foramina containing the exiting nerve root. The pattern of disc degeneration will determine its effect on the regional nerve roots. Looking from the top down, we again have the tough fibrous capsule of the disc called the annulus fibrosus surrounding the soft gelatinous center or nucleus propulsus. The spinal canal holds the thecal sac, another fibrous membrane that contains the nerve roots of the cauda equina, as well as the cerebral spinal fluid or CSF that circulates in and around the entire central nervous system including the brain, spinal cord, and nerve radicals. The nerve roots exit the canal via the neural foramina. Generalized degeneration of the annulus fibrosus will result in a broad-based disc bulge that will impinge on the spinal canal and deform the thecal sac. If large enough, the bulging disc can press on and compromise all the central nerve radicals, causing weakness and numbness in both legs. A disc protrusion is a more localized process where there is focal degeneration of the disc that extends into the spinal canal or, as in this case, the neural foramina where it can compromise a single nerve root. Again, if this is the L4-5 disc, this would be the L4 nerve root. Dermatome maps show the approximate sensory distribution of each of the nerve roots, which allows us to correlate imaging findings with the patient's clinical symptoms, as we will see in the next example. A focal defect in the annulus fibrosus provides a channel for the nucleus propulsus to extrude out of the disc into the spinal canal or neural foramina. As such, this type of degeneration is referred to as a disc extrusion or disc herniation. Again, if the herniation is large enough, it can impinge on and irritate the regional nerve root. Here's an actual MR image in a young individual with new onset right leg pain. 
This is the disc between L5 and S1 showing a large herniation displacing the right L5 nerve root posteriorly, similar to the appearance on the animation. The left L5 nerve root is normal, surrounded by a cushion of bright fat. In contrast, here is a normal individual's MRI at the same level showing bright fat completely surrounding the thecal sac and both L5 nerve roots. Our patient described pain starting in the low back, radiating across the right hip, outer thigh, anterior shin, and great toe corresponding to the L5 distribution on the dermatome map. Let's briefly look at some additional causes of back and leg pain. A series of bony joints can be the source of discomfort starting from the degenerating facets of the spine as described previously. Similarly, strain or degeneration of the SI joint can produce a stabbing pain in the upper buttocks region that can radiate to the hip. The degenerated hip itself can also cause pain directly over the hip joint that occasionally radiates down to the outside of the thigh. Distinguishing between the different potential sources of pain is paramount to institute appropriate therapy and relieve the patient's discomfort. Now, there's one more potential source of leg pain that's worth mentioning called the piriformis syndrome, aptly named as it involves the interaction of the sciatic nerve with the piriformis muscle belly. The piriformis muscle extends from the sacrum to the greater trochanter of the femur and acts to externally rotate the thigh. The sciatic nerve is made up of the nerve roots from L4 through S3 and passes into the upper thigh just anterior to the piriformis muscle belly. In some individuals, the proximity of the muscle to the nerve can cause irritation that manifests as a pain radiating down the back of the affected leg, especially with prolonged sitting. The CT image with the patient lying on their stomach shows the relationship of the sciatic nerve just anterior to the piriformis. One treatment option is to use CT guidance to place a needle into the space between the nerve and the muscle and instill anesthetic and steroid to alleviate discomfort. Patients may also use a donut style pillow when sitting to reduce pressure on the nerve and muscle. The best way of course to treat back pain and leg pain is to avoid it altogether. As with any mechanical structure, such as this suspension bridge, each component contributes to the support of the entire edifice. Removing or weakening even one cable increases the stress on the remaining elements and could, with time, lead to failure of the entire bridge. The same is true of our spines. The tendons, ligaments, and muscles surrounding the spine help stabilize the column and minimize the stress on the intervertebral discs. The more conditioned and stronger the surrounding musculature, the less stress on the discs itself. Over the next few minutes, we're going to go over some of these support structures and give you some maintenance and conditioning tips. Remember that in the neutral position, the lumbar spine has a gentle anterior curvature or lordosis of approximately 20 to 40 degrees. As we bend forward, the spine straightens and slightly reverses with a kyphotic curvature of 5 to 15 degrees. Most of the movement as we bend down to touch our toes actually comes from the flexion of the hip joints. There are four major muscle flexors of the hip. The first is the iliacus, which attaches to the iliac crest and inserts onto the lesser trochanter of the femur. The second is the psoas, similarly inserting onto the lesser trochanter. This particular muscle originates from the firm attachments to the transverse process of the vertebra T12 through L5 and therefore is a major stabilizer of the lumbar spine. The anterior thigh muscle or quadriceps is aptly named as there are four distinct muscle components including the vastus medialis, vastus intermedius, and vastus lateralis. These are the three largest members of the quadriceps family, all originating from the shaft of the femur and inserting onto the patella as the major flexors of the lower leg. However, the smallest and most anterior of the four muscles is the rectus femoris. This similarly inserts on the patella but crosses the hip joint and actually originates from the iliac crests and therefore contributes to hip flexion. As such, we'll ignore the other three members of the quadriceps family when talking about the hip flexors. The final major hip flexor is the sartorius, 
originating from the iliac crest, crossing anterior to the femur, and inserting on the medial aspect of the proximal tibia. Our skeleton model will now demonstrate the function of the four hip flexors with a simple leg raise. Suspended from the chin-up rack, the flexors pull the femurs upward. The psoas muscle again stabilizes the spine. However, gravity pulling on the outstretched legs would cause the pelvis and spine to rotate inferiorly. To prevent this motion, the rectus abdominis muscle pulls the pubic bone toward the rib cage and thus provides additional anterior stabilization of the lumbar region. Straightening from the bent position is accomplished predominantly from the powerful extensors of the hip. These include the gluteus minimus, medius, and maximus muscles. The intrinsic deep and superficial muscles of the back provide further stabilization of the lumbar spine, especially when straightening from a bent position. As you have seen, strengthening and conditioning of the musculatures around the lower back is paramount to maintain proper support and alignment of the lumbar spine, and therefore limiting the development of debilitating degenerative disc disease later in life. The following are a few simple exercises to get you started. A good beginner maneuver is the abdominal crunch. This exercise focuses on the rectus abdominis muscle as it pulls the trunk toward the pelvis. We're all familiar with the classic setup as a sine qua non of core maintenance. As with the abdominal crunch, the rectus abdominis pulls the rib cage toward the pelvis, slightly flexing the lumbar spine. The four major hip flexors then pull and rotate the entire trunk toward the knees. Straight leg raises are another great way to develop the core flexors. As demonstrated earlier, the four flexors pull the femurs upwards. The rectus abdominis stabilizes the pelvis pulling the pubic bone towards the anterior ribcage of the trunk. Another variation of the classic sit-up is the V-sit double knee tuck. Positioned on the edge of the bench, the trunk and legs are flexed centrally with the hip joints at the apex of the V. Beginners can use their arms to stabilize and assist the movement until the core is sufficiently strengthened to allow a hands-free routine. Finally, development of the hip extensors and the intrinsic muscles of the back can be accomplished on the hyperextension bench. The gluteus muscles extend the hip joints and thus pull the trunk upwards. The strap muscles of the back stabilize the spine itself. Remember to pull the arms backwards as you rise up to help with both full extension and to work the more superficial muscles of the upper back. So there you have a brief overview of how our spines work and the most common causes of back pain. Because of our upright stance and our relative longevity, our backs are prone to degeneration as we age. However, with regular core exercise to strengthen the supporting muscles, tendons, and ligaments, our back should last a lifetime. As with anything in life, maintenance is easier than repair. So get out there and get active. We'll, we'll see, see you next time. time.